welcome to City Club Missoula's July Forum, Drug Trafficking in Montana. I'm Julie Maloney, and I have the honor of serving as the chair of the City Club Missoula's Board of Directors. Thank you all for being here today. City Club's mission is to bring people together to inform and inspire them on issues vital to the community through public forums that encourage the discussion of new ideas and the free exchange of thought. We have a deep commitment to civility and civil discourse, even when we discuss challenging issues. Before we begin, some thank you. Thank you to Missoula Community Access Television, which records our forums as part of their media assistant grants to nonprofit organizations. MCAT serves our community on cable channels 189 and 190. MCAT occasionally live streams our forums on its live lo local live platform as well. You can find videos of past CCM forums by clicking the video button on our website, cityclubmissoula.com. Many thanks to our sponsors, especially those at the executive level. They are Blackfoot Communications and First Security Bank. Our executive level sponsors are key partners in helping to expand audience access and reliably planning and conducting our forums. We're grateful to all of our sponsors and we invite you to join them. Thank you also to our wonderful board of directors and our minister, Danny Howlett. On behalf of City Club Missoula, we acknowledge that we are in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. Today, we honor the path they have always shown us in caring for this place for the generations to come. We are grateful to share this special place with our neighbors and friends. Our moderator for today's panel is Rob Cheney. Mr. Cheney has been writing about Montana and the Rocky Mountain West for his whole career. After completing his bachelor's degree in political science, at McAllister College, he worked for the Hungry Horse News, Bozeman Daily Chronicle, and numerous freelance opportunities before becoming a staff writer at the Missoulian in 1997. There he covered local government, education, business, public safety, and the great outdoors until he became the managing editor in 2022. In that time, he has made reporting connections between Montana and China, Nepal, Jamaica, Brasilia, Japan, Poland, and Canada. In 2020, he received a Neiman Science Journalism Fellowship at Harvard University, where he completed writing The Grizzly in the Driveway. He is currently working on his second book about the environmental future of Glacier National Park. Rob will introduce our panelists, and I will see you again around 1220, at which point we will begin table talk, and then open the forum to questions from the audience. Over to you, Rob. Thank you kindly and welcome everybody. Um, I have been asked to severely restrict the actual amount of biographical information provided here, so I will just. Oh, <laughs> I've been asked to, to greatly restrict the uh, amount of biographical information of our speakers, so I'll give you the edited version. Um, at our far left, uh, your far right, is uh, Jesse Laslovich, an Anaconda native who received his law degree from the University of Montana in 2006, uh, and a bachelor's degree with high honors also from UM in 2003. Um, he began his legal career at Datsopolis, McDonald and Lind here in Missoula, and also taught as an adjunct professor at the University of Montana School of Law for two semesters. Prior to becoming United States Attorney, he served as Regional Vice President of SCL Montana Health Montana Wyoming since 2017 and was Chief Legal Counsel in the Office of the Montana Commissioner of Securities Insurance where he prosecuted security fraud cases. During 2011 and 2012, Laslovich also served as a Special Assistant U.S. Attorney on securities cases in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Montana. And closer to me, is our new police chief and longtime uh, law enforcement representative, Michael Collier, who is also a Missoula native who began his law enforcement career with the Coeur d'Alene Police Department in 1994. He returned home when he was hired by the Missoula Police Department in 96, and there he has been a field training officer and motorcycle officer and held many collateral duties such as SWAT member and SWAT team leader, drug, drug recognition expert, and uh, state coordinator for drug recognition expert training. Chief Collier has also been a Missoula Police Department instructor in the use of force and intermediate use of force tools such as taser, chemical munitions, and impact devices. He was twice interim chief during the chief of police recruitment periods between November 2009 
2019 and March 2020 and March 2023 and May 2023. He was appointed Chief of Police by Mayor Hess and confirmed by the Council in June. He has a degree in law enforcement and a graduate of the 244th session of the FBI National Academy. And as you are probably all aware, we are here to talk today about some of the drugs that are giving these two gentlemen an awful lot of job security. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to them and they have a, both a presentation for us and then we will go to some questions. Thank you, Thank you Rob. And good morning, uh, everyone, or maybe it's afternoon. Uh, it's good to see all of you and to be here in Missoula. I thought I would start by thanking Julie uh, Maloney, who is a longtime uh, friend um, and fellow high school basketball uh, referee. Um, she is one of the best. Uh, so I hope, yes, yes. I hope none of you have booed her at any of the basketball games here in Missoula. Um, I also want to say uh, I've been U.S. Attorney for just over a year, which is uh, hard to believe. And if there's one thing uh, that has hit me beside the head, it is the cooperation that takes place between our federal partners, so the FBI, the DEA, uh, Homeland Security, Secret Service, Social Security Administration, and with our state partners, the Division of Criminal Investigation with the State Department of Justice, and especially our local partners. And I just have to tell you um, that the city of Missoula is really lucky to have Chief Collier as your new chief of police. He is as good as it gets. So, um, yeah. So I'm glad he's speaking after me. Uh, he'll be better. So what we thought we would talk about, he's going to talk about uh, drug trafficking uh, in and around uh, Missoula. I'm going to talk a little high, higher uh, level just of what we're seeing uh, in Montana. Of course, in the U.S. Attorney's Office, we prosecute federal crimes that are committed in Montana. Uh, we have offices here, Helena, Billings, and in Great Falls. And so, Danny, if you would start with the first slide. We're here to talk about fentanyl, and perhaps most of you uh, know all this, but I think just a level set. Um, it's 100 times more potent than morphine. Uh, and you can imagine then why there is a demand uh, for it uh, because of the, the potency as far too many, not just Americans and Montanans, but people internationally who are turning uh, to fentanyl because of that impact that it has uh, on them. I've included the Sinaloa and Jalisco cartels in China. And the reason I've included uh, that bullet point, we know uh, that most, if not all, of the fentanyl uh, and methamphetamine coming into our country and indeed being trafficked throughout the world is coming from Mexico. Uh, and in Mexico, uh, the precursors that are necessary to make fentanyl uh, are coming from China. This is an international problem. And I, one of the messages that I would like to leave all of you with today is that the, the United States Department of Justice, of which I am a part, is fully committed to trying to combating this. And so what, and by that I mean um, we have to deal with the heads of the snake. Uh, and, and the two big ones are the, the, are the cartels in Mexico, uh, and then of course um, our diplomatic uh, relations and work with China. Um, and until we do that, it's going to feel like a whack-a-mole in this district in Montana, in the state, uh, our district of Montana that I have the privilege of leading, and then districts, all the other 93 U.S. attorney offices throughout the country. Um, we have to deal with the, the supply side. And the DEA is all in, the administrator and Milgram, the resources that they are throwing at dealing with uh, the cartels uh, would blow you away. Um, we frankly just, we, we need the cooperation of our uh, governmental counterparts, uh, those two uh, countries. Um, and that is um, not as easy as perhaps uh, we would like. Um, six, and ten, six of the 10 pills trafficked in our, our country have a potentially lethal dose. That lethal dose is a tip of a pencil. So it's not much that we're, we're talking about. Um, and 
and, and then uh, of course the uh, for people under the age of 50 it's the leading cause of death in this country more than any other uh, cause of death according to the DEA and so Danny as we go to the next slide part of our issue of course um, on the demand side is how cheap fentanyl is certainly down uh, uh, near the southern border so I, I have the honor of serving on Attorney General Garland's subcommittee uh, for border and immigration uh, and anybody been to the San Ysidro port of entry uh, down at the border yeah biggest biggest in the world uh, that port of entry uh, they estimate that about 90 percent of the drugs that come into our country are through that port of entry either via vehicle which I'll show you in a minute either uh, via air either on water or they on ships that they go up uh, the, the west coast and have drop-off points uh, that then are distributed in California Oregon Washington and then make their way to uh, the east and ultimately into uh, our state. They're using drone uh, capabilities to have drop-off points. Um, it really is stunning. Uh, and the Border Patrol, and I'll talk about this a little later, is dedicating a lot of resources, trying to get creative from a technological standpoint to stop the drugs from coming in to the country. But if they, and when they do, because they estimate, you know, we, I said in about 90% of the drugs coming through uh, that uh, coming into our country or through that port of entry, they estimate that they're only uh, getting less than 20% of the uh, of the drugs, um, despite all of the resource resources being thrown at it. So, in San Diego, because it's right there, 50 to 50 cents to a buck a pill, and then as you come up further north, of course, it's get it gets a little uh, expensive. And in Montana, the chief will I don't want to. You may get into this, at least as uh, into Missoula. Uh, I know uh, we have a lot of our drugs that are coming into the western part of the state through Spokane. Uh, and then in the eastern part of the state, they're coming through Denver. So as we move to the uh, next slide, and then Montana, of course, is um, uh, quite expensive. It's big money for, for these folks. So what are we doing? I'll go through these quickly because I'm sensitive to uh, the, the time. But the DTO stands for Drug Trafficking Organization. Uh, our office, again, in conjunction with all of our partners that I mentioned, uh, dismantled that DTO, uh, indicted 22 people, and all of them went to prison. Um, we have specific defendants. These are just a few examples to give you a flavor. It's not just fentanyl, of course. Meth is uh, still king, although fentanyl is giving uh, meth a run for uh, its money. Um, but the individuals we are able to... Um, uh, ultimately hold accountable are going to prison for a long time and in the federal system there's no parole so that's the sentence that they're going to serve I call out the Steve I the Stevensville uh, sentence of 16 years that we just received uh, recently and then I call out the drug trafficking organization in Billings those are pending indictments over 20 uh, people with connections to uh, one of those cartels that I mentioned at the start of the, the presentation um, it, it this the the one down at the bottom uh, we had three different locations one at Crow one at Northern Cheyenne one at Billings we had the FBI the DEA and the US Marshals all working collectively preparing for weeks to uh, dismantle that and arrest those uh, uh, those dangerous uh, individuals and they did it now it's our job to hold them accountable so Danny just these next uh, slides will give you a um, feel for uh, further data so uh, RM HIDA stands for Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug um, Trafficking Area. Uh, and this is, so this would be, we're a part of this in Montana. This is uh, us, the states uh, in our uh, region. And I'll get to Montana in the next uh, slide. But you see in the top uh, left with fentanyl, it was fairly steady. And as it got into 22, it skyrocketed in terms of the amount of fentanyl that was seized in our region. Uh, and then 2023, of course, is just uh, first quarter data, so we anticipate uh, that that will be higher than last year. That's a good thing, right? We're making progress in seizing, but it's also a bad thing that there's, uh, not a, there, there, uh, there's still fent uh, fentanyl flooding uh, our state and uh, region. On the top right, it's methamphetamine uh, powder. You can see there's still quite a bit of that fluctuates uh, a little bit. We anticipate again 2023 will be uh, just as high as 2022. And then the bottom left is cocaine. 
and then the bottom right uh, is heroin. We forget about, uh, I, th I shouldn't say forget, um, you know, with fentanyl and meth being so prevalent, there is quite a bit of cocaine. Certainly, in, I will tell you, in the Bozeman area, uh, we have uh, a number of cocaine cases, and we're seeing some of it here in uh, uh, Missoula, the Missoula area as well. Then as we pivot to uh, the Montana uh, slide, uh, Danny, um, so you'll see that there are uh, similarities, fentanyl, uh, meth, uh, uh, cocaine, and uh, heroin, except uh, with cocaine, it's been rising, um, as I said, and we're seeing that uh, it, particularly in the in the Bozeman uh, area, uh, but uh, a similar story, unfortunately, uh, compared to uh, the region. And then uh, I, my time is running short, and I'll look forward to answering questions, but if we go to the next slide, Danny, this uh, uh, goes to um, weapons. Uh, we have a gun violence problem in, in this uh, state and nation, in my view, and and I will tell you without exception, uh, the, the drug dealers that we are uh, busting have a gun, and not just one, they have uh, many guns. And in the federal system, uh, if you possess a gun, it's mandatory minimum five years. If you brandish it, it's seven, and if you discharge it, it's 10. Um, something that is a priority for our office and me personally and just just show so it's handguns rifles although we have uh, far too many automatic uh, weapons to this the data doesn't it's not reflected in this data i'm just telling you it's uh, caught me flat-footed um, so then as we turn to just the final slides here i've got just 30 seconds left i wanted to give you i don't know that you can see this this is a picture i took i talked about the u.s border patrol um, and when I went down the, to, the, to the port of entry, uh, you can see, so uh, th what the Border Patrol will tell you they need, and this came from the Deputy Commissioner of the U.S. Border Patrol uh, for our country. And what do you need? What can we do? And he said, we need resource, we need money uh, from Congress so we can enhance our technological capabilities. Those of you who have been the San Ysidro uh, port of entry know that you have the primary checkpoint and then a secondary checkpoint. Primary checkpoint, there's a Border Patrol agent who looks at your paperwork, and then is, if, if they're suspicious or there's a degree of randomness to it, we'll send them to the secondary checkpoint. The cartels know, and because fentanyl is so cheap to make, that if one of their drivers goes to the secondary checkpoint, uh, in one instance, that there's a probability that perhaps they won't go through that secondary checkpoint the second time, so they'll send that, that driver with uh, more uh, fentanyl with the hope that they'll get through that primary checkpoint. Here's the, here's the rub. All of us go through TSA, right? I know I'm out of time here, so forgive me. Um, all of us go through TSA. Uh, oh, okay. Um, and, okay. It was that bad? You wanted me to stop? Uh, and, and we're screened. And what they're doing at the, at the border is they're actually, for some vehicles, sending them through an X-ray uh, machine, for lack of a better word, but the car goes through um, the, uh, the machine, you just, just as we were, we were, were going to a gate in an airport. And then, the, and so you're able, they're able to see, um, if there are what they call anomalies, what this picture shows here, can anybody see in the middle there, the circles? I know it's, um, hard, um, but it has those, those red circles are, uh, circling bags. What do you think those bags are? Drugs. So they have that. They, they can search it, and they do, pull off to the side, and it's otherwise it would not have, the, that vehicle would have passed through both of those checkpoints, and those drugs would have come into the country. So when the Border Patrol, uh, ha, they have the, the resource, if they have the resources, they, they think they'll be able to get more drugs. Again, this is those coming through uh, uh, via vehicle. The next slide, you'll see it's not just with um, drugs, those are two human beings who were being smuggled into our country. Uh, again, otherwise would not have been uh, detected. Uh, it's both pictures. You see the top one and then the bottom one's actually a second uh, vehicle. And you can see to the right, your normal vehicle, right? They have luggage, people going through, no issues. Uh, so you have an agent who's actually seeing if there are anomalies, they can pull over and then if there's illegal activity uh, proceed accordingly. And then I thought I would just close uh, with um, the southern border security compared to our border here in Montana. 
This was a trip that I uh, went up with the, our border patrol up in Montana that's uh, just north of Haver. Um, I don't see many people coming um, over the border. That's a barbed wire fence, uh, actually. And those of you who know the area up there, it's 20, 20 miles north of the border is the town. Then you have Haver, 20 mile, about 20 miles south. Uh, so you, it's, it's pretty remote. Does that mean that we don't have drugs coming through the northern border? No, of course not. And we actually are prosecuting cases that have, where the uh, folks have flown from Mexico to Canada and then tried to come uh, to uh, Montana to um, uh, act actually traffic the drugs and due to the great work of the Border Patrol at our ports of entry in Montana those folks have been stopped and we've been able to prevent the drugs from coming into the state. It's, a, it's an overwhelming problem. Uh, the, the cases that our office prosecutes overwhelmingly are drug and gun cases. Really talented, dedicated public servants and we couldn't do it without the extraordinary dedication uh, and commitment from uh, our state, local and federal partners. So with that, I will conclude my remarks and turn it over to Chief Collier. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the nice compliment. The, the good news is I left a gratuity there on the chair for you. The bad news, it's a counterfeit 20 that we took out of a drug operation. So. Well, he took a little bit of my thunder. That's the risk with going second. But um, I, had to, I was going to talk about the coordination and cooperation a little bit, too. I hope that everybody in this room um, can rest assured that the stuff you see on TV about the big bad feds rolling in and they kick the local guy to the side and they take over is just not our experience here. So we ha are really lucky. We're really grateful to have great coordination with the federal government in you know, a number of ways, the prosecutors and the, the federal agents. Um, I always like to use an example of, if you remember last spring, we had a pretty credible violence, uh, threat of violence at Hellgate High School. And this is my example of the great partnerships we had. I had federal agents walk up to me and ask to volunteer and stand a, stand a traffic post, you know, directing traffic or going and sitting on a potential target house or whatever. No ego, no nothing. It's just, you know, just this, in the spirit of cooperating and making Missoula better. And in the drug trafficking game, that, co that cooperation is still there. So we appreciate all of that. Um, I know it's, the topic is about drug trafficking, and as Mr. Lazovich said or alluded to, you can't talk about it without talking about fentanyl. And so the the we tr we prioritize our work in the MPD as public safety first, and enfor enforcement is you know a second to the public safety aspect. And so that's kind of where I'm going to start too, is with the public safety thing and. Uh, fentanyl is is leading the conversation on this every day I'm sure in Missoula people are tipping over from fentanyl overdoses they come to our attention several times a week I would say um, sometimes more than once in a day and what I mean is that people are taking fentanyl and overdosing and falling on the street essentially dead so what are we doing on from the public safety perspective number one is we equip our officers now with single dose fentanyl um, you know, inhalers that are mounted on their on their ballistic vest, on their body worn vest, and they have with them all the time and the the Narcan anecdote to provide to pe people who have overdosed on an opioid, and they use them a lot. So anecdotally, I can tell you that um, one one particular call, three people went down all together. We went and Narcan all three of them. On more than one occasion, once just about a week and a half ago, we Narcan the same person twice in one day. So it is a thing, um, but we always are going to put the safety of everybody first and those Narcan um, applicators is, is one of our best tools. Um, we use them, of course, for ourselves. If we should be exposed to that, we can Narcan fellow police officer, another first responder. They're valuable for people who unknowingly may have in ingested um, fentanyl, so they may be thinking that they're taking some other type of drug, um, and as you heard earlier, a lot of these drugs have fentanyl already inter introduced to them, so you have people who are unknowingly ingesting it, and if they have no tolerance, then their risk for overdose is huge. And, and lastly is the opioid user, who they know they're using fentanyl, and they either get too much or whatever, and, and they tip over too. 
but we do not discriminate on that. I mean, it is the dignity of every person out there um, that they get our best service. And so if anybody's thinking out there, boy, they're doing some pretty self-destructive behavior, taking fentanyl knowingly, that is true, but we, that's not our role. We get in there, we take care of business, and we get them to emergency medical care, and then um, hopefully get them to some type of an assessment and treatment plan from there. The next thing we do to kind of mitigate some of this risk is we use spectrometer now whenever we can. Spectrometer is a sophisticated light testing, uh, drug testing device that use rays of light that I really don't understand. Um, what we used to do in the day, back in the day was we'd take a little bit of the product, we'd put it into a vial, break open, um, you know, chemicals that interact with it, it'd change a color and tell us what kind of drug it probably was. Now we don't have to um, necessarily even open up the drugs. We can introduce it to a spectrometer. A spectrometer will shoot through the packaging and it will print out what the high likelihood of that drug is. And so it really reduces the exposure for our people. We're happy to have that type of technology available. Um, and getting a fr the last part of this is getting in front of all of this through prevention, education, deterrence is, is really <laughs> a huge priority. So much of this stuff, the tragedy can occur, um, you, know, you know, it's too late. And so getting ahead of this um, and try to introduce to young people in particular the inherent risks and, and you know, going back to the meth not even once type of program, uh, trying to keep people away from that. When it made a big splash, I, you know, in the Missoula a couple years ago, I had, at the time I had two kids in college, one has graduated, one still in college, and I just told him, you know, I know the college kids are at par parties. I never participated in that type of stuff, but um, I, I think it happens. And I just told him, if any of this stuff starts to bubble up, you got to just get away from it because you could inadvertently be exposed to something that that would be life changing to to a lot of people. So prevention and education is huge. I have some statistics here for you. Uh, they're not all inclusive. What I where I pulled my numbers from was from our HIDA task force. That's, a, as, as you heard earlier, it's a high intensity drug trafficking area. Missoula's had that designation for as long as I can remember, um, 25 years or more probably. And so we are part of a multi-agency drug task force that has federal, state, and local officers, um, analysts, and so on, and they work out of a shared space to attack, attack the drug trade. Their mission is to disrupt and dismantle drug trafficking organizations. They are not out there trying to pop street level users for using fentanyl or cocaine or whatever on the sidewalk. They're not even out there looking for, you know, somebody who's trying to pay the bills that month and they're selling a little of what they have. They're looking for drug trafficking organizations. And by definition of that, that's going to be generally three levels of distribution. So the bigger fish, bluntly put, is, is what their mission is. And so disrupting and dismantling DTOs is, is their job. We, have another, we participated in another task force, which is the Montana Regional Violent Crimes Task Force, uh, where we partner with FBI agents. And uh, as it suggests, it is about violent crime. You cannot have drugs without having violent crime, and you cannot have violent crime without having drugs. So they have um, similar statistics, but I, I, didn't, I didn't gather all that uh, for this presentation. I, they're largely going to be consistent with the Haida statistics and the statistics out of the US Attorney's Office. I thought he was cheating off my paper when I saw his stats. I was like, hey, these are awfully similar to what's going on right here in Missoula. But um, as you'll see there, we talk about um, fentanyl and methamphetamine are king and queen. They are number one and number two and probably changes, you know, uh, a little bit along the, along the way every month. But uh, they are the number one and number two. What you're seeing is year to date through May of 2023. So there's, that one represents, that chart represents about 17,700 dosage units of fentanyl. I know we're over 800 because I just had, a, had some people with 300 pills the other day. And so that's a big chunk, you know, just in the first five months of, of this calendar year, you can see how much methamphetamine and how much fentanyl is out there. Fentanyl's almost put heroin out of business. I put heroin up there because it's zero, 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 and I th thought that would be a good way to illustrate how heroin's fallen off. Fallen off. Again, I know that we, we just did see some, so that number's north of zero now, but not by much. I also included the marijuana numbers in there. Marijuana is still a scheduled one prohibited substance in the federal system. You'll see later that we don't have any marijuana cases. But it's contraband. When we come across it in other polydrug investigations, it is seized. We have not prosecuted a, a marijuana case 
Um, certainly this year, I don't remember what the stats are, probably probably not last year at all, right? Um, and, and methamphetamine, you'll see the way that we are generally getting is through ice, or they call it crystal or whatever. It's the chunks of methamphetamine more than the powder. So anecdotally, why is fentanyl a thing? So the drug investigators would have told you about in 2021 or so, you'd go buy methamphetamine and they'd throw in some fentanyl pills, like a buy one, get one. You know, it was literally would not charge you for it. They would give it to you for free. And guess what that did? It created a demand. And so here we are now in the first five months of 2023, having seized 17,000 dosage units. The other, the other uh, nice, or not nice thing, the other reason for this fentanyl thing, the fentanyl boom is the use. So they can smoke fentanyl. You know, generally you, in, you inject heroin. But if you're smoking fentanyl, you don't have to worry about tracks. So, you, don't, you know, if you're in a job interview or you're going home to your family, your friends, you're not showing tracks on your arms. You've smoked the fentanyl and it's not quite as obvious. So, and it's cheaper and uh, it's much more readily available than heroin. So, uh, that, that wraps up my presentation. I, I didn't want to do a whole lot of statistics. I knew that they are very consistent with what you're going to see uh, from Mr. Lazovich. Um, the, last, the last couple things here outside of the drug statistics is just the, um, the assets and the guns, or assets and the weapons. What you can see there is cash and vehicles. What we use asset sharing for is operational demand. So our drug investigators need money to buy information and drive, buy drugs. They need money for operations. Heck, we buy our canine's dog out of, out of drug forfeiture because we use the dogs for drug investigations so we can use drug forfeiture for, for that type of operational expense. And the last one is about uh, weapons, I believe. You'll see that it is about two to one handguns over rifles, but there's weapons involved in just about every type of investigation we do. So thank you for your time. I don't want this to be a downer. I, I, want you, I wanted it to be serious and everybody to understand the real, the real public safety risk to fentanyl is a thing. But I also want people to understand that there are really um, coordinated efforts by um, all levels of government, uh, prosecutors, and um, and law enforcement together. So thank you for your time. Looking forward to taking your questions. Thanks, gentlemen. Now it's table talk. Table talk is a very rich part of every city club forum and arguably the gist of why we're here. We will take about 10 minutes for each table to introduce themselves and come up with one question related to the presentation to ask of the panelists. A board member with a mic will come around afterward for a volunteer from each table to ask the agreed upon question. Please refer to the slide for the guidelines re regarding Q&A. Have fun. All right, everybody, we've come to that time. As I said at the beginning, we are committed to civil discourse. So we ask that you keep your questions respectful and you avoid making statements. We also ask that any members of the media save their questions until after the forum. Our panelists should be able to stick around after the forum ends. When asking your question, please stand up and introduce yourself, avoid making statements, and ask one question. Please be respectful, respectful of others and don't interrupt while questions are being asked. The board will handle anything they feel is, that they feel needs to be addressed. We have two, mi two people with microphones that will come to your table to have you ask your question. Please raise your hand and let them know you have a question. And I'm going to pass it off to Rob to start the questions. Thank you kindly. How's that? Better. There we go. Sorry. Jesse, if I could start with you. Um, when you were describing the, the level of activity on the southern border and the, um, the Mexican influence and the for beyond that, the Chinese suppliers. Up here in Montana, are we sort of limited to a reactionary um, tail end of the snake effort in, in what we can do locally here? Or is there anything that you're working on that allows us to get sort of ahead of the problem? Or are we just waiting to pick up things after the big stuff has happened at the south end? Yeah, it's a good qu question, Rob. So most of it is on the tail uh, end of it, just necessarily, right? People are 
are caught uh, and then they're ultimately prosecuted. Um, I mentioned that uh, border and immigration subcommittee I'm on. I mentioned the Rocky Mountain Haida. So you have the regional folks who are doing the proactive work uh, to try to prevent the drugs from coming into uh, our region and that goes all the way to uh, California. I mean, it's not enough uh, from a resource perspective, but it's making a difference. Um, uh, similar to the task force uh, here that we have in Missoula and really we, those task forces we have in each of the bigger uh, cities here um, in, uh, in Montana. Um, but we're reliant on our national partners um, to uh, make a meaningful difference uh, with the cartels and with, with China. And it's slow. The reality is it's just really slow. Do, do we, just to follow on that, um, you mentioned the northern border and some activity up there is is that becoming a place where you can get ahead of the game? Um, yes, it, it's it's just so limited. Um, I know in upstate New York. So my colleague, who is the U.S. Attorney in Northern District of New York, they have a significant uh, um, immigration problem and and drug trafficking problem up there. We don't see it as much uh, in Idaho, uh, in Montana, North Dakota. There's some in Washington, of course. Um, so, uh, in it, for good reason, most of the resources, in fact, even we're taking border patrol agents off of the northern border and putting them to the southern border because that's where uh, the major uh, problems are. Mike, one of the things that um, Missoulians are getting very familiar with, unfortunately, is the challenge of mental health related law enforcement interactions. Um, and I think, as you pointed out, an awful lot of those are drug related. What's sort of the the back in, or the continuum between dealing with somebody with a drug criminal issue and dealing somebody with a mental health issue, and how is that affecting what your officers can do on the street? I opened um, with my comment about public safety, and I'll, I'll fall right back on that. Regardless of what the underlying root cause is, we have to make the situation safe for everybody. And particularly if you got a crime against somebody, we, we have a criminal justice component to that. The big difference is, is that hopefully we can, um, hopefully don't have a violent crime against somebody and we can parse out getting down, getting into more of the root cause, which may be a mental health crisis or maybe uh, drug influence. So um, plugging people in me mental health crisis into appropriate resource is an important part of that. So we have a mobile support team that um, can roll with us on calls or in lieu of us on calls, hopefully at some day, um, that we work with, you know, we work with now. We train officers in crisis intervention techniques and try to help parse out the, the kind of the non-criminal incidents that need more of a mental health response. Um, a, a similar but different, I guess, when you're talking drug influence, somebody's under the influence of drugs and acting out and whatever. We yeah, we have a felony possession, felony possession, a dangerous drugs charge. They're not game changers to us, really. The big thing to us is making sure that the situation's safe, seeing if this person can get into some type of a treatment or whatever in lieu of prosecution and and go that route rather than putting them in jail and have them get out and get high again. So the things like the the mobile, I can never get the thing right. Um, the mobile treatment team, is that taking a load off your shoulders or is that just an expansion of the things that everybody's trying to take care of? I think we're working to the way of, of seeing more results uh, of time being taken off of our plate. We're not there yet where mobile support can just go on all, the, all these calls. I, th I think we're just inherently a little bit nervous about putting them into a dangerous situation. So oftentimes, Right now, we're going to go with them and make sure we have our arms around whatever is going on. And if it's safe, then we're out of there and let the let them do their expertise without us there. So there's a real tangible benefit to us there. Um, end game, yes, I think that we can get to a point where mobile support can probably take the information they have from 911 and feel comfortable going to that by themselves, and we can stay out of it. All right, and I'm not sure which of you, uh, either of you, can take this next one. We, we hear an awful lot of scary stories about the um, effect of fentanyl on unsuspecting bystanders, like if it gets in the air or if the, the drug dog sniffs it in the suitcase or all kinds of other things that you see on social media. How, how much of that is um, overblown and how much of that is uh, something that people really need to pay attention to? 
Well, when I started yelling at my kids about being at parties where there's powder, it was because of those type of videos. What some more conversation has produced is some of that might be a little bit dramatic. And I'm not the expert in the room, so I still tell people stay away from the powder because it sounds like the narrative about airborne fentanyl killing you walking in the room is maybe not as um, as credible as it originally was. But again, I'm not the expert on it. I would just recommend people staying out of that environment. Yeah, And we've not had a, a, a catastrophic event with our dogs either yet, so thank God. All right, folks, up to you. Is that for me? I'm sorry. I, w I was just commenting that... Uh, no. oh. I'm, sorry. Well, I'm handing it over to you now, so... <laughs> Thank you, uh, Sean Belabradic, Fulcrum Security. Uh, my question was related to uh, Narcan. Uh, is there training available for private security members of the public so that we could carry and administer Narcan if we witness um, an overdose? Thank you. There is. There's online training put on by the manufacturer. It's it's really simple stuff. It's a um, it's a nasal applicator, one and done type applicator, and it talks about the time frames to where you can reapply. The beautiful thing about Narcan is if if the medical condition that the person's experiencing is not opioid overdose related, the Narcan doesn't do them further harm. So uh, if we have any indication that it's an opioid overdose, we'll do it. And if it's not, then that's great, but we, we at least know that we've ruled out the, the overdose part. Uh, Jim Bedarek, President. Um, I've been uh, hearing from some journalist friends of mine about like new drugs entering the Missoula area. Um, would you be able to speak about data about new stuff coming in? Uh, how often does that happen? How much are we finding it? Is it like does do we see things shifting up the landscape of what's around? You know, the data I looked at doesn't really show anything that jumped off the paper at me. They kind of come in waves, it seems like, you know. So a while back when we were started to see these rave parties in town, you'd see things like MDMA, you know, come into town, people use a bunch of MDNA or hallucinogens, and then the rave event's over and they kind of go away. So the data that I've looked at is the more trending type of stuff, which is fentanyl's way up, methamphetamine's always present, Heroin's kind of way down, those type of trends. And pharmaceutical drug abuse is kind of down, too, on the street level. I, I believe a lot of that is just a product, again, of fentanyl with the high potency, cheap, easy to get, uh, easy to use type of thing. The the pharmaceutical prescription abuse is probably going on in the metal, medical settings more than on the street. Hi, my name is Faith Marshall. I'll be a second year elementary education major at the U. Uh, our table's question is, where do you see the biggest increase in drug use? Uh, high school level, professional level, university level, homeless population, et cetera. So it's a, a good question, and my chief will answer too, and whatever he says to correct me, he'll be right. Um, but um, I think it's all of the above. I mean, I, uh, in Montana anyway, we have pockets um, uh, where there is more uh, prevalence of drug trafficking and drug use than in Missoula. As we were saying earlier during when you guys were doing table talk, Billings, for example, has uh, serious issues um, that we're trying to uh, address. Uh, our reservations um, have uh, serious um, uh, issues, and we, the federal government, were for six of those eight federally recognized tribes, were the the main player in terms of the the major uh, crimes. Um, and in Indian country, and work closely with our tribal partners. Uh, they're key to our work. Um, young people are are abusing uh, alcohol early they've told me this that when they're at parties they 
um, are drinking with the adults uh, in their 10, 11, 12 years old. That's generally speaking, of course. Um, but uh, so there's there's the youth uh, element um, as well. Um, but I don't see where it's just siloed uh, to a particular uh, uh, group of people in the cases we're handling. Yeah, I would agree too. I think the drug investigators would generally tell you that cocaine seems to be um, more about, I don't know if you want to call it mainstream, but like professionals using cocaine, whereas, uh, like we said, fentanyl so cheap and methamphetamine's cheap, you may see more of that in, you know, the homeless population or people without the resources that a professional person would be using cocaine. It's kind of anecdotal, but I can, I can see the logic to, to their kind of conclusion on that. Uh, Ray St. Brady, Glacier Country Tourism. I think uh, the question that we were talking about is really what are the impacts on our court system, uh, whether it's the local or the federal level? Are are we seeing backlogs? Are we able to process? I mean, where are these? Where are they ending up? Ending up? It's a great uh, question, uh, and frankly, it's a serious uh, problem um, in, from a resource uh, perspective. So. Um, as an example, uh, and we're all tied together, right? So we're, you know, what we bring to court obviously will burden uh, our our judges and their staff. And then if people are convicted and, and sentenced, it, it's a burden on the U.S. Probation Office. I mean, it's a, um, it's a circular relationship. Cases coming to us from our uh, partners. Um, and to give you an example, because we can't keep up with it on, on, the, on the federal side, we create prosecution guidelines. I hate them, um, yet I sign them, uh, which is crazy. But, the, but it's to give our AUSAs some guidance in terms of the cases that we will take federally. So to give you an example, when it comes to fentanyl, uh, when we, what, you know, 2020, 2019, uh, you know, 10, 15 pills of fentanyl would, that, that actually uh, got our attention. Now it has to be over 100 pills. That's how we've become numb uh, to this. I mean, the chief mentioned just here in Missoula the amount of pills that have been seized. Um, we don't have enough prosecutors. We got, we got two new drug and gun prosecutors, I'm pleased to say, in the last uh, uh, budget that was proposed by the president and passed by Congress. Um, is it enough? No. Did, did the BIA get more uh, agents, the FBI, uh, our federal partners? No. Uh, so we have more prosecutors, but we don't have more investigators. We can't have the cases unless they're investigated and presented to us. Um, I think the I, I hesitate to speak for the judges. Um, so if you know one of our federal judges, um, uh, don't tell him what I'm about to say. But uh, <laughs> but I, one of them did tell me that um, that they certainly with in the federal system, you know, you have the, the, the Article Three judges, and then they can go to senior status. They still have a caseload um, that we are doing fairly well uh, when it comes to the judges uh, who are um, hearing the cases and we're under strict timelines um, uh, uh, anyway. So I don't think that that is slowing us down. It's just getting the cases um, uh, to us. Uh, and and that's a and how do we how do we get more resources? It's from all of you, um, the taxpayers through the policymakers. Yeah, pretty much the exact same scenario in state court and state prosecutor's office. So we work with our prosecutor on triage in cases, really. You know, the, the average just possession of dangerous drugs users probably not going to be held in jail and pending trial in Missoula. They'll probably be released without recognizance, on their own recognizance or at a minimum or at a maximum with some type of a bond. However, we try to coordinate with them about the the people who are the issue. Maybe they're in on a felon possession of of a firearm or something like that, but they have a long criminal history or they have other violent um, offenses that are pending. They probably need to stay in jail. And so we try to get all of that coordination done with the prosecutor's office, and then they can petition the court on holding people on bond. But it is a resource issue, both in jail capacity and as a resource issue to our to our county attorney's office. If I could follow on that, um, in a pie chart, where do these kind of crimes fall in your workload compared to 
theft of property, domestic abuse, um, whatever else falls in the pie chart? Are they, what, what's the percentage? Well, I, I don't know the numbers, but I mean, just so much of this is interrelated. People commit crimes to get money to buy their drugs, or they commit crimes to pay their drug debt, or they commit crimes to rip another drug dealer of their product. So they are inter- interrelated to some degree, and I don't have a pie chart in my head or any statistics, but you know, we, we talk about um, just like all the co-occurring nature of, of all of this stuff blended together, and that's why it takes coordination with our prosecutors about which people do we really need to focus, who are the public safety threats that need, that need prosecution attention. Uh, Bert Caldwell from Retired Community here. Uh, first thing I want to do is say, Mike and uh, Jesse, thanks for coming. Thanks for taking your time. Okay. Uh, the question we had here was, with the problem we've got with drugs here in town, where's the money coming from? And after that, where's the money going? Are you talking about the, like the drug users, where are they getting their money? I, I would say there a lot of them are committing crimes to get it. And they're stealing stuff out of your shed and hawking it to get enough money for a handful of fentanyl pills or a, a point of heroin or whatever. Where, where the money is going is we, uh, the DTOs I talked about that the Drug Fit Task Force are using. We work those up as kind of far as our resources will take us. It's oftentimes kind of into the northwest region, sometimes you know down towards the southern border, and then they'll hand it, hand it off to another task force, uh, maybe a, a federal task force on the southern border, and they'll continue to follow that. And that money's going back to the drug organizations, largely out of out of the states. So um, and if that answers your question, I think that the local users, the local kind of, you know, low-level dealers, is that money's kind of being accumulated and through criminal activity, and the drug trafficking organizations ship it back to the big bosses. And I'll just add on to that. So in the federal system, we have the crime of aggravated identity theft, and the chief is exactly right in terms of how they're getting their money. Where they're, st- and, you know, he mentioned his ex- the a few examples. Then we have many cases where people are stealing someone's identity. Uh, they'll break into the car, steal a credit card, um, uh, checks, um, and, and in the federal system, uh, and so they're kind of low level. I mean, I mean menaces, of course, to our communities, but. Uh, we take them um, because it's a mandatory minimum two-year prison sentence in federal prison for aggravated identity theft, um, and it's a way to um, get them off the uh, get them off the the streets. Um, so um, so that is good. And then on the where the money's going, you, I, I showed the slide in terms of uh, the pills for fentanyl uh, here in, in Montana, and we are concerned about the the traffickers, right? The big, not the addicts, but the ones who are poisoning. Uh, our uh, communities, um, they're the ones getting the money and they're the ones who are going uh, across the southern border bringing it to the cartels, right? We, we know these cartels, uh, th- they're, how much money they have and I, I, I just can't overemphasize how sophisticated they are. The stuff that we see on TV or in movies does not do it justice. The kind of resources that these people have, they're transnational criminal organizations. These aren't just some random uh, people who have guns and uh, you know have, have banded together and uh, are making fentanyl. They have chemists, they have technology people. Uh, it, it, there are many countries uh, in many ways in terms of the, the resources. So that's ultimately where the money's going. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks you guys for being here. Uh, talking about resources they have locally and across the state, are there any things you're striving for? Anything that you're seeing nationwide that you'd like to bump up your resources to to combat this? Well, kind of on the local level, I'll tell you the technology is just huge. You know, we are constantly working phones and that type of stuff and so staying up on the ability to investigate that technology store that data analyze the data it is forever changing when you know many years ago when i was in the detective division we had a detective who on the side you know downloaded a phone for us every once in a while it is a full-time job plus some and so 
uh, having having the people trained up on that technology, having the subscriptions. You know, all these outfits charge us a bunch of money to for us to use their subscriptions to pull the data. So it's really time consuming. It's really expensive. It's it's labor intensive. So off the top of my head, I'd say that that's the one thing that, and we're going to just continue to try to chase is the technology avenue. There's no question it's a technology uh, uh, issue. Um, and for me, at least in Montana, uh, it's we need more boots on the ground uh, to, for investigating uh, cases. I mentioned the BIA earlier, um, grossly underfunded um, and not enough agents who are serving uh, our reservations. And do you think that uh, these sophisticated drug, drug traffickers know that they don't, there aren't a lot of law enforcement resources on reservations, they do. Uh, and so it's not a coincidence that a lot of these DTOs are in Indian country because we don't have a law enforcement presence there or not a significant one anyway. Same with um, the FBI and you're having to pick and choose the priorities. We have, you know, we, we're here to talk about drugs and guns, which are terrible, but then we have a lot of really bad people who wanna commit crimes against children. Um, and uh, we have resources necessarily so that are dedicated to pursuing and prosecuting those people the white collar criminals too it's there's just not enough boots on the ground and so when i see the rhetoric nationally that um the use at least with the u.s department of justice that the fbi is a part of that the dea is a part of the u.s uh, marshals um needs to be shrunk or, or changed it will have an impact uh, because they will cut it nationally and it will cut the boots on the ground and it will affect in my view, the safety of our communities. Hello. Um, I was curious if the uh, drug trafficking and human trafficking are ubiquitous, or they do they go pretty hand in hand? Because I know there are signs you can be vigilant of when somebody's being trafficked. And I'm curious. And it's harder to spot a drug trafficker, so I'm just curious how, how often those are going together. I keep falling back on my old answers. So much of this is co-occurring, I think, that yes, I think there's a fair amount of that. That um, if you're having somebody who's trafficking humans, they're probably on the side to some degree trafficking some drugs too, and maybe vice versa. Uh, the, really, the really tragic thing about human trafficking is it is... It is one asset. It is a person that they continue to use and abuse and traffic. The drug side of that, if I sell all my product, I gotta go get more product to sell now. So that's why the human trafficking is is such a tragic and terrible thing is that one person is victimized over and over again. So that'll probably be that that offender's main kind of you know, business, so to speak. But I, I would be shocked if there wasn't some degree of, of, you know, kind of crossover between the two topics. So if I could ask just one last one. We hear frequently um, that if people weren't buying this stuff, this wouldn't be a problem because they wouldn't have anybody to sell to. Um, we also hear that chasing after uh, drug users fills up a jail without actually solving any problems. But is there a supply side, or excuse me, a, a, a recipient side of enforcement that has some potential in the same way that going after the supply side does? Uh, I'll start if that works, Chief. So one thing we're doing in the federal system, and it's a great question because there are there are two parts of this: the supply and the and the demand. Um, and you've heard, of course, at the state and local levels of drug treatment courts, we've never tried that um, in the in the federal system. Um, we we started it just this year. Our office is usually the obstacle uh, in terms of who gets in because, as I said earlier, the people we're indicting are the drug traffickers. But there are people who are getting caught up in it who are dangerous people that are trafficking, but they're doing it because of their addiction. Um, and the one thing on the federal side 
with uh, the U.S. Probation Office uh, and the resources they have and the, con the with contracting with uh, um, providers that can treat those who are addicted, we thought we would at least ex explore on a pilot basis whether this could be successful in the federal system. So we just started, as I said, the first part of this year. We have it in Missoula, Great Falls, and Billings where our federal courts are. Um, and we have people who are in the program, and we'll see if the 18 months, uh, if they successfully complete it after plead, they have to plead guilty, they, we have to admit them into the program. If they successfully complete it, then we rip up the indictment at the end. So it's a carrot and stick approach. If they don't successfully complete it, then they're going to proceed to sentencing and they're go going to go to prison. Um, this is a little unique. Other states are, are trying this, um, but it gets to the demand side at least a little bit. Um, the folks, as I said, the majority, the vast majority of the people we're prosecuting are not addicts. They're not users. They're preying on people to make a bunch of money. I can speak a little bit to the drug court thing. I served on drug court here for a little bit when I was the detective captain, and you get mixed bag result. There's some really kind of frustrating and tragic uh, people that come through there who just the power of addiction is not something that they were able to get overcome, you know, in the in my tenure there. And then you have some really great stories that you know, just are kind of inspiring that people who have really changed their life and the drug court was the right answer for them. So to, to your question and kind of the, the whole broader topic of this, there is no, I don't think there's a magic approach. I think we need to a, attack the drug trafficking organizations and keep supply as limited as we can. The furthest end of that spectrum is the prevention and education piece, probably to young people, you know, and, and trying to address the demand for it. And then in between is those things like treatment and recovery and, and prosecution, some blend of that to try to just have a real holistic approach to a, a, a pretty significant social issue for us. Thank you, Rob, Mike, Jesse, for your time today and for all that you do for our community. Again, thank you to our sponsors, especially First Security Bank and Blackfoot Communications. And of course, thanks to you, our audience. Our August 14th forum will be about the Big Sky Passenger Rail. <clears throat> be sure to check out our Facebook page or website for more details and to register. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you guys for coming.